Order, order. Laura Pitcock to move a motion. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to move that this House was considered 10 years of the work capability assessment in relation to employment and support allowance and universal credit. Thank you, Chair. This feels like such a, an inadequate environment to describe the work capability assessment and its brutal consequences. I wish that every single person affected by the system could be here with us in this room and look at those who will defend this system in the eyes. I hope that what I'm about to describe, the people opposite with me, you know, not many of them, uh, will feel shame and I hope that throughout this session we can do justice to the experiences of those people subject to the work capability assessment. The work capability assessment in relation to employment and support allowance and universal credit should be a simple concept. That if you have a physical or mental health problem or disability that prevents you from working, either temporarily or permanently, you will receive a replacement income from the state if it is found that you cannot work and or have a limited ability to work. I will talk about the face-to-face -face application process and the assessment and how I feel they are draconian, elicit fear, deny justice and have, in some circumstances, ended up contributing to the end of life. As Francis Ryan wrote in The Guardian recently, suicide is becoming a feature of the system. Everybody in this room will know somebody who is unable to work for whatever reason. Those people with personal wealth are often able to avoid having to prove that they are worthy of income replacement. They're saved from having to share every single detail of a condition or illness and do not have to wonder if they will be believed because they have that personal wealth. People without savings, on the other hand, are only one step away, one accident, one conversation with a doctor from being subject to that system. Based on the evidence gathered from my constituents when they come to surgeries, submissions from professionals and from the vast amount of submissions that I have, I have received uh, from people currently applying for social, this social security payment, here are some of the elements that we believe are wrong with the system. In both the application form and the face-to-face -face assessment, the descriptors which enable a score to be given to assess the ability to carry out a task are essentially a functionality test. They cannot capture the fluctuating nature of physical and mental unwellness or disability and how that could prevent or limit the ability to work. People often describe how they feel punished for telling the truth, that perhaps, yes, they could go out unescorted on a journey somewhere, but the test was not interested in, for example, the panic attack before leaving the house or the emotional recovery afterwards. That perhaps venturing to the supermarket will have been the only trip out that month, but making the journey could lose someone their entitlement. In reality, one day you might be in the depths of despair. The pain from your condition may be unbearable. The next day, you might be able to have a laugh over a cup of tea with a loved one. The question is, should you lie about that laughter or feel shame about it because you might get points deducted? Does that laughter render meaningless the pain that you felt from the day before? Fundamentally, does it have any bearing on your ability to work? I think not. The test ignores the complex reality of living with long-term or fluctuating conditions. Many people have told us that they do not feel accurately represented by the reports written about them. Advisors have openly claimed that they uh, see copy and paste jobs. A constituent read that they were apparently happy and confident during the assessment when in fact they were crying and shaking. No wonder as many as 74% of ESA decisions are overturned at appeal according to the Citizens Advice Bureau. This of course is one of the consequences of using private, a private company to assess the medical conditions of people who need support. Not having people qualified in the conditions or illness which they are presented with is also a huge issue. It is claimed that Maximus offer uh, incentivise uh, health professionals in terms of the number of reports they're able to complete and logic says that that could directly lead to there being a proliferation of inaccuracies. Ultimately, profit should not be made from ill health. It leads to corner cutting, misplaced priorities and to defend the marketisation of this process, in my view, is obscene. 
I'm not sure why the government, or, or I'm not sure they realise, or, or members opposite, uh, realise just how truly terrified some people are of the brown envelope yeah. from the DWP. They know that they're going to be forced through a lengthy and extremely difficult process. They'll have to attend an assessment that once they've received a decision uh, notice about the outcome of their work capability assessment, they are often inaccurate and misleading, leading to long, stressful appeals processes of up to 18 months. That's 18 months of those people without the entitlement that they deserve. And of course, this process exacerbates poor health. The government makes things worse. When people, because of their physical or mental health condition, ask that their assessment be carried out at home, the answer is almost always no. My casework and other agencies have substantial evidence to the private contractors to show that my constituents would have severe difficulty attending the assessment centre. The stock response is this. If the claimant can get to their own GP or to the hospital, they can attend the assessment centre. I mean, how cold-hearted is this? If the person well, does... I will give way. On... Just a minute. Thank you, Sir Henry. On, on that point, um, does she not agree that there is, a, of course, a difference between going to a, a location which may be quite close to your home, which you're familiar with, and an assessment centre which may be uh, uh, many uh, miles away, which may be difficult to get to uh, unless you've got your own transport? The member is absolutely right. And in a place like North West Durham, where we have an inadequate and expensive transport system, when you are feeling unwell and the stress of having to go to that assessment, it not being able to be carried out at home is un unjustifiable. If the person does manage to get to the assessment centre, the assessor then uses that evidence of their ability to travel, walk, sit comfortably and cope with social interactions. One person, one person got in touch with me to say that they had to sit in so wet clothes due to incontinence issues that they had in the waiting room of that assessment centre. Is this a system that anyone here can really defend? Is anyone really comfortable with a private provider forcing people to attend these assessments in pain, in worry, to be degraded by the DWP? If a person is found fit for work when in fact they are not, it can have a huge impact on a person's mental as well as financial well-being. It can have a direct impact on their entitlement to housing benefit, council tax benefit, plunging a person into destitution with increasing debt, risk of eviction and untold stress. People found work wrongly fit for work are then expected to do job searches and training and are even sanctioned. And it comes as no surprise to any of us on this side that in 2016 the UN concluded that the government uh, had committed grave systematic violations of the rights of people with disabilities. The report should have seen an end to this government, but they limp on. If you do, however, go on to win an appeal, the frequency of reassessment is, is, is too, too frequent. No sooner have you won that appeal are you being reassessed. Even people with terminal illnesses have to endure this. And imagine the re-triggering, assessment after assessment, uh, on, uh, the re-triggering of your mental health difficulties if you have to describe the historic sexual abuse that you have been subject to in that process. Let me now go on to tell you some of the contributions from people who got in touch. Uh, one person said that this process feels like psychological rape, expressly designed to make you feel like you are the absolute property of the state, that you're not human and that you are continu your continued survival is a basic affront to society. Another said, when you are disabled, you are defined by able-bodied people what you cannot do rather than what you can do. No disabled person wants to be a burden on society. They want to be an active contributor but are denied this by society. And the whole thing should be abolished as it's cruel and a pointless exercise in ideology. And of course it is about ideology at the end of the day, isn't it? Because the system, its complexities, its high thresholds, the way employment and support allowance and higher rates of universal credit have been denied to so many people cannot be seen outside of the context of years, 10 years almost, of austerity and budget cuts. Literally taking money from people who are disabled, unwell or dying. And what are the worst consequences of this system? The ultimate results of this brutality. Jodie Whiten lived in Thornaby, not too far away from my constituency, and took her life 15 days after her benefits were stopped for missing a work capability assessment when seriously ill. The independent case examiner found multiple failings on the DWP's part of them. Simple cases of them not following their own safeguarding procedures. Her mum 
joyed of is campaigning for an independent inquiry into benefit deaths. And I am sure everyone on this side would say all power to her in that campaign. Yeah. Stephen Smith, 64, who had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, osteoarthritis and an enlarged prostate that left him in chronic pain, failed a work capability assessment in 2017, which meant that his ESA payments were stopped. Anybody who saw Stephen's emaciated body on social media will have been horrified. <laughs> Stephen died last Monday. Jeff Hayward, who won his appeal seven months after his death, had a debilitating skin condition and spent his last 18 months fighting for a fit-for-work decision. Michael O'Sullivan, aged 60, from North London, had a long-term mental health problem and the coroner found the benefit process was a key trigger to his death. These are the real life tragedies of a broken system. And I don't think I can bear to hear the minister get up and say yet again that we should come to them with our individual problems with the system as his predecessor did, because they are not individual problems. They are systemic failings and a consequence of privatising social security alongside 37 billion worth of welfare cuts. Because let's be honest, this is institutionalised bullying and harassment of sick and disabled people. I have no doubt that administrative ineptitude is part of it, but on this scale, there can be no other conclusion. Deliberately stripping people of their rights to disrupt the welfare state and the very concept of legal entitlement. The government has trodden all over the expectations of citizens that they will be looked after in their hour of need. And for what? To replace the state with private and family provision, to boost the coffers of private insurers and replace legal rights with charity subject to moral judgments of deservedness. But it really doesn't have to be like this. How can our social security system uh, be about that, about security and not about punishment? The Labour Party has rightly committed to scrap the work capability assessment. That will be a big step forward, no doubt, and will be welcomed by disability rights group and welfare rights agencies alike. In the meantime, why don't the government start the process of rectifying some of these injustices in the system by taking the vast amounts, the vast amounts of evidence from medical professionals into account, from GPs, from consultants, from nurses? Testimony should be believed fundamentally because the DWP, the culture permeating that department is one of disbelief, which looks so cynically upon people who uh, request help. Stressful face-to-face -face ass assessment should only be used if there is an absolute necessity and that lack of evidence uh, to decide entitlement, that there isn't enough e evidence uh, present. The assessments should be of last resort. The system should be designed fundamentally by people who are the experts through experience and experts who understand how conditions affect ability to work or not should be employed. Any social security system to replace the work capability assessment as it exists today should not be a functionality test with arbitrary rules which do not account for the fluctuating nature of a person's condition, disability or illness. There needs to be a revision of the assessment criteria, which is linked much more closely to the real world of work or the work that the person was doing. Knowing whether somebody can move a carton of milk with one hand you know, to, to one side to the other cannot allow us to understand a person's comfort or ability to work in a specific environment. Any process should include an assessment of the additional support that that person would need to ease them back into the workplace. Recording of assessments should just be standard unless the person asks that they are not recorded. The government really are dragging their heels on that recommendation. Private outsourcing of these assessments has got to be scrapped. The market has failed all aspects of the social security system. Placing company profit before the need of the people interacting with the system. When will the government understand that private enterprise and illness are incompatible and inevitably lead to injustices that we see today? And fundamentally, Chair, and on this point I'll close, at a point in life when people are dealing with the stresses of not being in full health, of need and support of their disability or mental health condition, they should not be subject to further stress, degradation and even abuse inflicted on them by the state. The system should be designed on the presumption that people are telling the truth. These people are telling the truth 
when they come to see the assessors, not forcing them through this humiliating and, ex and exhausting process. That often the result uh, results in them winning the appeals at tribunal anyway, only with the help of uh, the excellent underfunded advice agencies and many of our caseworkers actually in this room. For many, their last fight on this earth is not with their illness, but it is with the state. And that fact alone should lead us to scrap this dreadful system. Yeah. Yeah.